All right. Hi, everybody. And people who are still online with us, we're going to try this again. Um, I'm incredibly excited to be here with Dr. Sylvia Earle, who's a good friend of mine. And I've known Sylvia for quite a while. And we've been to the Arctic together. We've been to Antarctica. I mean, for most people, Sylvia needs no introduction. But if you haven't heard of this great lady uh, who's been a conservation ocean hero for 60 years, uh, at least 60 years since you were born, <laughs> we won't give out your age, although I just did attend one of your birthday parties. Um, so, you know, Sylvia is a National Geographic Explorer. She's a United Nations Environment Program champion, and she's really a massive inspiration to, to so many of us. So thank you so much for being here. And I'm, I'm very proud to have you in the Paul Nicklin Gallery today. Oh, I'm so pleased to be here, Paul. This is heaven on earth right here in New York City, where you can celebrate wild things, including Paul Nicklin. <laughs> this is about Sylvia. So, uh, so yeah, we are, the reason I put this gallery together, Sylvia, is, and I'll have to say that this is sort of a dream come from, dream come true for me and that it's more than just putting pictures on the wall or selling art to fund the work that we want to do for ocean conservation. It's much more as a convening place for people who care and to have conservation, you know, discuss cons conversations about conservation. So to be able to have one of my great ocean heroes in this space is, is a real privilege and an honor. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. What I love about these images is that they tell stories. You know, it's just one frame, but you get something that really changes the way you think when you see the bear swimming underwater or the bear with water dripping down and, and with just a cascade. You have a way of communicating that transcends words and transcends most images. So I really thank you for bringing this to the world. That, that means everything coming from you. Thank you. And that was, I think, one question I was going to ask you later, so we'll maybe come, come back to that, but thank you. Um, so to everybody, for the hashtag for this event today and for all week, it's hashtag Save Our Ocean. So keep typing that, keep entering that in on your social media. So this week is, starting tomorrow, is the UN Ocean Conference, which is the largest summit ever dedicated to the oceans. And you're there. You're, you're a key figure. You're leading the charge. So, you know, what, um, and, and for me, you've, you've had such an amazing career. You know, again, I said 60 years, but you said. It's a good start. Good start. <laughs> Just getting more. And this conference, uh, I'm one of many. We are one of many. This is a momentous event because it's really the first time that the United Nations has focused on the ocean. It's like it's time, way overdue, actually, because the ocean is most of the world. That's where most of life on Earth actually exists. It's where the water is. Most of Earth's water is ocean. And where there's water, there's likely to be life, at least on this planet. Yeah, absolutely. So this is hard on you because you're incredibly humble and you're very selfless and you're such a, you speak so outwardly about the oceans. I'm going to put you on the spot and I want to, for all of us, I want to know more about your journey from the time you were born to the time you fell in love with the oceans and the journey that you've been on. It's an incredible story. I mean, you could write a book on it, but... Everybody has a wonderful story. <laughs> I'm going to hear yours, but... I got knocked over by a wave not far from where we are right now. It was on a New Jersey beach. <laughs> and the ocean got my attention. And I want everyone to respond. The ocean should have our attention everywhere. Everyone, even if you've never seen the ocean, even if you've never touched the ocean, the ocean touches you with every breath you take, every drop of water you drink. Where does it come from? It's the ocean. It's the ocean. It's taken me decades to really make this journey of discovery, but then it, it's true with the people everywhere. We have learned more about the ocean and why it matters in the last few decades, since the middle of the 20th century, than during all preceding history. It's amazing. For the first time, we have a view of Earth, and to see that Earth is mostly blue from afar, because there are people up in the sky and there are instruments up there measuring the ice, measuring the change, putting things in perspective. I've had the pleasure of living underwater on 10 different occasions where you actually stay in the sea with a little underwater laboratory, but you don't stay inside the way most of those astronauts do when they're in a space station, they're, except for a few lucky ones who get to do spacewalks. You go swim into the ocean outside of your little underwater station 
That's the whole point of being there, so you can be out roaming around, getting to know the fish face to face, getting to know creatures in the sea in some place other than in a market or on your plate swimming in butter. <laughs> I'd rather see them swimming in the ocean and getting to know them as individuals. I mean, you know individual bears. You know individual narwhals because you get to see them. They're no two alike. They have faces. They have personality. And unlike the attitude that some people have, oh, fish don't feel anything. They, they don't have any pain. They're just dumb old things. Well, we know better because being there with them, watching them, they're curious creatures. And they're more than just pounds of meat, that's for sure. So I learned that by spending thousands of hours in the ocean. I've used more than 30 different submarines. I've helped wow. build submarines, and I want to build more. In fact, I want everyone to get out there, down there, even below where you can go, you're so good at holding your breath, <laughs> like, like the dolphins, <laughs> like the whales, but even using scuba or rebreathers, we're still limited to this part of the ocean. So as when we go up in the sky, we can't fly, but we can package ourselves with an airplane or a spacecraft and go, you know, way high in the sky and millions of people fly. But, you know, it's really amazing that only three people have ever been seven miles down. The first two in 1960, and then James Cameron came along in 2012, he built his own submarine, it took eight years, but he did it. He's a movie maker, he's an explorer, fellow explorer in residence at the National Geographic. But he had, as I do and many others, I think, this yearning to see what's down there. How, had, how deep have you been? And now, you know, you've done thousands of sub-dives. I mean, not deep enough. They call her the deepness for a reason. <laughs> so, I've, I've only been to the average depth of the ocean. That's about the depth of the Titanic. Um, it's two and a half miles. Wow. Maximum depth is seven miles, about as deep as airplanes typically fly going across the country or around the world, seven, 35,000 feet plus a bit, you know, that's, but I've only been to, you know, the average depth, which is 4,200 meters. And I, I long to do much more. Okay, just for the record, Sylvia's only been down somewhere between 10 and 14,000 feet. So that's, we're calling that not too deep. I think, yeah. I think deepest I've ever been is 300 feet. So I'm, uh, I would like to bridge that gap. That's really impressive. I will, I'd love to come with you. And, and you, you touched on it before. And I think for me, what's so special about you is you, you know, with your TED prize, you're obviously a gifted speaker. You're a gifted communicator. You have people eating out of your hand you you when you when you speak you're an incredible scientist you've just had such a you've had art science and conservation you've melded those three things together I'm a mom I'm, I'm a grandmother too I've got four grandsons three kids that's how you get grandkids you have kids <laughs> <laughs> it really works <laughs> okay so so what for you in, in that mix, how do you think is the, the, the best way to communicate? When, with, where does art fit into it? Where does science fit into it? Where does you know, the communication and social media, and how do you see it all fitting together to reach the masses? Boy, everybody, everyone, everyone has something that can be drawn upon to communicate, to make a difference. Some people have a way with numbers and can calculate the evidence and, and some scientists are really good at doing that and that's their gift, your gift, the ability to think like a bear, <laughs> think like a whale, think like a fish and, and see the world through their eyes and then be able to share that with your fellow humans in ways that really transcend what I mean, you're, you, you're unique. You have a, this special capability. So, you know, everyone can do something. Now, we all we can't do everything, but the sensitivity of art reaches people in ways that with all of the facts and figures and the wisdom of science, it's a cerebral kind of thing, and it doesn't always get to everyone who needs They can say, yeah, yeah, I, I understand. The ocean's in trouble, and I ought to do something. But, you know, I, they just, but when you touch their heart with art, with music, 
with poetry, with something that blends and brings science and art, music, all of it together with just the fun, the joy of recognizing that, look, no matter how long you live, life is too short. Wouldn't it be great to live a thousand years and, and imagine that what you do can really be, you can witness over time. And actually, I feel as though I have lived in a time of change that transcends a thousand years because in decades, even kids can see the change. So what we do right now, this is a pivotal moment in history and why what you're doing, what's happening here in New York, this United Nations meeting, what's happening all over the world, if the next 10 years are likely to be the most important in the next 10,000 years because what we do or what we fail to do right now, armed with knowledge, <laughs> unprecedented knowledge during a time of unprecedented change, we still have time, but not a lot. There are only 10% of the sharks remaining from when I began diving. It's not my fault that they're gone. <laughs> I've been trying to get people to understand that sharks are really good guys. And it's different from when I began diving when we thought the only good shark was a bad shark, a dead shark. And that, that I, as someone who wanted to go out in the ocean, was told, you've got to watch out for those man-eaters. Mm. And then I thought, I don't have to worry. <laughs> I don't qualify. <laughs> Only the guys have to worry. <laughs> but really, no human has to worry about being consumed by a shark. But think about how many sharks have to worry about being consumed by us. Absolutely. We're talking about millions of sharks being taken out of the ocean every year for shark fin soup or for sport. Imagine, who, who can feel the joy of killing? I don't understand. It's, it's just, we need to trade that off for the joy of caring. Absolutely. Beautiful. Um, so, you know, so many people always ask, they ask me all the time. And, and so I want to turn the question back to you that I get all the time is, okay, you've got me, you've inspired me. I care. I love the oceans, but what, what can I do? What, as a citizen of this earth who cares about the oceans, I just don't know is, you know, what, what should I do? So if you could give someone a little shopping list of where they can start. Look, uh, in the <laughs> Look in the mirror. What do you care about? What do you do? What are you good at? Put that power to work. Do you play the violin? Okay, use that power. Um, do you have, again, a way with number, a way with words, a way with art, a way with photography, a way with diving, a way with kids? You know, take a child, if you're a grown-up, to some wild place and see the future through the eyes of a child. And if you're a kid, grab a grown-up <laughs> and do things in reverse. Take them and ask them, what's the world going to be like when I'm as old as you are? And, and what can you do together to make a difference? If you see trash, whether it's on the street or the beach or in the ocean, don't let it just stay there. Grab it, pick it up, turn it into some place where it is going to do something positive instead of negative. Make better choices about what you consume. Realize if you are determined to consume wildlife from the sea, people call it seafood, mm. sea life, ask the question, who are you? Not what are you or how do you taste, but who are you? Where did you come from? How old are you? What, what place in the ocean is empty because you've been taken from the ocean? What was the impact on an ecosystem? Was, were you caught with a hook, with a net, or dragging across the seafloor? Shrimp, terrible cost to shrimp when dragged across the ocean floor. You take the whole system. And it's like using a bulldozer in New York City to catch um, taxis <laughs> and you, you, you tear up everything else in the process and throw it away that's the bycatch issue of taking wild fish now okay so if you are in a coastal community and you're a local fisherman you're feeding your family feeding your community that's another whole thing that's a response to something that you you you, you need that's a part of your life and, and truly your livelihood but so much is being taken from the ocean based on choice. Large industrial 
factory scale extraction of wildlife to feed cows and chickens and pigs, to feed salmon, to not feed people who are truly in need, but to feed choices sometimes that we, we can say no to eating tuna. What's it going to matter to you if you never have a tuna fish sandwich or sushi or sashimi? It's not a matter of need, it's a matter of choice. And I gave up eating wildlife from the sea, actually animals, period, now that I know what I know. And so you can make a choice. And if you do eat a tuna, do so with great respect and realize the bite not only that you're taking out of the tuna, but the bite you're taking out of the ocean and the things that make the planet function in our favor. And it's, it's so true. I mean, it was, I was in university and I was, you know, diving and I was getting some, get, taking some sea life from the ocean to eat. And one day I got this big scallop and I went to my professor. I said, how old are these scallops anyway? He goes, oh, those are about 70 years old. And all of a sudden I was like, I feel like I'm eating grandma. I mean, it's just, and I, I have not eaten a scallop since because it's just, once you know that, that, that knowledge. Yeah, so, All so I mean. Trophy may be 30 years before they even start to mature. I mean, to get old enough to be able to have more orange ruffy. And some sharks also take a long time before they can begin to reproduce. Whales, good heavens, you know? They, they are not something that, like the animals we cultivate to consume that feed most of the animal protein that people consume does come from agriculture and they're plant eaters by nature. We force feed them fish, ground up, little fish, big fish, whatever it is, to feed to cows and chickens and pigs. I think if they had a choice, they'd probably say, please, I'd rather eat plants. And that's what they naturally eat. And anyway, we, we, now that we know, we can make better choices. So what else can people do? Learn about the ocean. We know more today than ever before. Mm -hmm. Kids, 10-year-olds have access to knowledge that the smartest, most knowledgeable people 50 years ago could not know. We did not have the insights that have been gained because of ocean exploration and communication, that, that things that have happened just on our watch, on, in our time. The smartest people who ever lived any time in the past. You think about the brainy characters who did things like develop language and numbers and who invented aircraft and, and many things that we now take for granted, but somebody had to do it. So where are those somebodies today to make the next generation better off? That's what people do. Every, every generation we learn things, we pass it along. Learn things, pass it along. And now we know what we could not know, certainly w when you were a kid, but definitely when I was a kid. <laughs> and that's cause for hope. Yeah. We have knowledge that can really take us to a better place. Learn how to live within the natural systems that give us everything that we need. Uh, economy, security, health, but mostly life itself. So that's that's fantastic, beautiful, and and for me, I mean, when I'm out there on the sea ice, sometimes when I'm alone, I get I get down, you know. I'm like I, you know, you you see such beauty, I but get down, but it's in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you keep getting up in the morning and having so much hope and feeding hope and finding hope spots and and just encouraging the world that we must save these oceans? We have no choice other than to save our oceans. But where do you get this energy to keep going? When I was a kid, the common theme was, you know, our job is to take from the natural world to fuel our prosperity. Cut the trees, turn trees into board feet of lumber. And oh yeah, trees are beautiful. We write poems about trees and birds nest in trees and all of that. But you know, the, the idea about using the natural world for our benefit. And we think about the ocean. The ocean was too big to fail according to the common wisdom of the time. And the, middle of the 20th century, but over the years, and it's taking until right about now, early in the 21st century, and it's culminating here in New York with the United Nations focus on the oceans that, okay, now we know. Maybe the most important thing that we discovered about the ocean 
and it happened in the last half century, is that the ocean is the cornerstone of life on Earth. No ocean, no life, no blue, no green, no us. Now, the ocean will persist, but it's an ocean that functions, generating oxygen, taking up carbon, powering the chemistry of the planet in ways that favor us and the rest of life on Earth as we know it, stabilizes temperature. You know, we, we now know these things, but maybe the, even more important than knowing how important the ocean is to everything we, every breath we take, every drop of water we drink, is that the ocean is vulnerable. It is not too big to fail. It is failing. I, we have been witnesses to coral reefs going from where they were in the middle of the 20th century, even from the 1980s to the present time. We've lost or see, seen this sharp decline of about half of the coral reefs. And if we keep going like this, where will, where will the coral reefs be as this century progresses? They'll be gone. If we, when I was chief scientist of NOAA in the 1990s, early 90s, I had a little piece of paper come across my desk that said that 90% of the bluefin tuna were gone from the North Atlantic. And the question wasn't, well, what do we do to turn things around? The question was, okay, how can we sustainably take the last 10%? <laughs> and I, I said, you know, are we trying to exterminate them because if we are, we're doing a good job? We only have 10% left to go. Well, we're still killing tuna, and not just bluefins, but many variations on the theme of tuna, but they all are top carnivores, even beyond your beloved bears, mm -hmm. because bears tend to eat animals that eat plants. Well, polar bears are pretty high on the food chain because they eat seals that eat fish, or they eat fish directly, but they big fish eats little fish that eat smaller things and smaller things. So you get this long and twisted food chain. It starts as on the land with sunlight plants and somebody who eats the plants. Lions and tigers tend to eat the somebodies who eat the plants. Mm. <laughs> but in the ocean, you get a much longer food chain. And that means every step of the way. You lose energy, but you retain some. You lose energy, you use it, and you swim around or breathe or whatever you do. So to get a pound of bluefin tuna that may be 10 years old before it winds up as sushi, you have to think in terms of thousands of pounds of plankton, phytoplankton, going through this food chain. And every year you live, of course, you, you've eaten more things and you retain some, but you burn some, whatever. Uh, how many pounds of whatever have you eaten in your lifetime? I mean, the older a creature is, the more is invested in making them whatever they are. So what we grow as farmers, the animals we grow, we tend to market as soon as we can. Chickens, a few months. Catfish and tilapia, they're plant eaters. They have to be around for about a year, sometimes a bit more. But there's a fairly rapid turnover. How old is a bluefin tuna, for example? Well, if they're caught just at the point of maturity, according to Barbara Block, who's a bluefin tuna specialist, 10 to 14 years before they can start to reproduce. They may be around for many decades, however. And some sharks, we just discovered just in the past year, scientists now believe that Greenland sharks that live under the ice mm -hmm. in the Arctic, in deep water, in many places on the planet, deep cold water, might be 400 years old. I had no idea. I've swam with them. I had no idea. That's incredible. Yeah. Imagine how the world was 400 years ago. Or some of the deep sea corals that began growing thousands of years ago. Some of the oldest living animals on earth are deep sea corals that are literally five, six, seven thousand years old. Wow, I had no idea. And they're sacrificed as we move deeper into the ocean to catch creatures such as Chilean sea bass, orange ruffy, the fish that's called Oreo, you know, a lot of the deep sea creatures that have been safe in their deep sea environment until recent times. I mean, they're, they're natural forces that ultimately 
uh, work, I mean, they die, they have diseases, or they get eaten by somebody else, but humans as predators transcend all other predators that have ever existed. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's incredibly, that's incredible, eloquent, beautiful, knowledgeable, and... Cause for hope, though. Cause for hope? That now we know. If you don't know that you've got a problem, you're not going to solve it because, phew, why would you bother? That's the way it was 50 years ago. Today, we're armed with knowledge. We have problems. <laughs> Look at what's happening to the warming of the planet because we're putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere against uh, the natural ups and downs of climate change, of planetary change, our impact on the atmosphere, on the land, on the wildlife, on the ocean and all the creatures who live there. We are truly a power to be reckoned with. And because we have such power, <laughs> why not use it to save ourselves by identifying critical areas on the land and in the sea, polar areas, of course, and use our mighty powers to protect these places, learn how to live within our means. Aren't we just going to move to Mars? I mean, that'll be an easy move, won't it? Let's go. Yeah. Where are you going to get the air? <laughs> exactly. Where are you going to eat? Here's a perfect functioning <laughs> system that wants to keep us alive and healthy and well and, and feed us, and yet we treat it so poorly. We have to return the favor. I, really, the most important thing that we extract from nature, certainly from the ocean, is our existence. And knowing that, realizing it, understanding that there are limits and we are perilously close and we have exceeded some of the limits by scientific analysis that we've we've gone beyond what is safe for us but we have the power to through our changing our behavior zeroing in on those things that are causing the most damage and we can actually I've seen change come about in a positive way uh, where I just was in Cocos Island 300 miles off the coast of Costa Rica last week, um, earlier this week, actually. Well, this is now Sunday. <laughs> so anyway, just the past few days, I've just got back. And I've been diving out there, first time was in 1972. Wow. And I've seen uh, amazing diversity, and then I've seen the decline because of, of industrial fishing. And now I've seen recovery that has come about because of protection. And uh, you've been diving in uh, pristine areas, places that have somehow managed to escape the major impact of what humans do. No place can escape global warming. No place can escape the acidification of the ocean. It's all happening all over the place. But actions that we, we can really manage up close and personal by bringing protection for the coral reefs, protection for areas that where, where we had taken, been taking the wild mm -hmm. things. We can learn to appreciate the value of, of a bear alive, the value of a whale alive instead of just pounds of meat and barrels of oil. And the same thing with tuna, the same thing with little menhaden fish or, or fish of all sorts. You know, of course they can be eaten and of course People will fish, but we don't have to take them all. <laughs> but we're perilously close. We could take every last tuna if that were, if we really were. We could have killed every last whale. We have the power to do we that. We tried. We, we came very, very close, but in the 1980s, we made a collective global decision with a few exceptions around the world. We stopped killing whales, and look at what's happened. We've seen a trend toward recovery. It's not, we're not totally back to anything like what the populations were or their impact on the chemistry of the ocean, the ecosystems as a whole, but we're on the right track. For me, it seems so easy to love a whale, but it's less easy to love an anchovy. Oh, and yet, on. no, for me, I, you and I do, <laughs> you and I get it, but for people to understand when an anchovy fishery collapses in, in Chile because they're feeding Atlantic salmon fish farms, yeah. that's such an important fish, these foundation fish around the world. And everyone's it, an individual. I mean, you look at Times Square on New York's Eve, you, if you were flying over like a pigeon <laughs> or any other bird, you look down, people all look kind of alike, right? It's just humans. But we know every one of us is different and alike with a, 
you know, awareness and, and decisions that we make. Well, it's true with other animals as well. Mm -hmm. It's certainly true of anchovies, it's true of tuna, it's true of grouper, true of parrotfish. It's just when you take them out of the ocean, you're leaving a, a space that isn't just filled up overnight. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. Again, a real privilege and honor to have you here. And um, the fight goes on. We have a lot of work ahead of us and, and feel very fortunate to be able to convene with you here. And you have something else to add, which excites me. <laughs> just a century ago, the United States really inspired the world with the idea, some say the best idea America ever had, national parks to proactively embrace places on the land. And it isn't just for wildlife, but you know, protect, give bears and birds and beetles and bees and water a, a, a safe place. It's taken a little longer to come around to the idea that we need to do something like that in the ocean. And I think one of the key positive things that I've witnessed starting Actually, it was President Kennedy who loved a little spot in the Virgin Islands and using his power as president with the Antiquities Act, established a little place around Buck Island where even the fish are safe. Today, it's like this little blue treasure in the midst of a, an ocean, the Caribbean, where on the order of 80% of the coral reefs are gone. And yet here's this little place that that shines and helps re restore places that, where the parrotfish are gone, the grouper, gone, the snappers, lobsters, you name it, they've been depleted. But where protection occurs, there, it's like a, a giving back place. Well, in the 70s, this country started about the same time that Australia established the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. and. We began in this country with the Florida Keys, and we began protecting historic, historically important areas like the shipwreck of the Monitor off the North Carolina coast, as with national parks, the natural, the historic, and the cultural <laughs> treasures embraced with care. And now, early in the 21st century, we're seeing a trend as nations began to really acknowledge the importance of doing for the ocean with blue parks, what has been so helpful and so important, so influential on the land. And it's just wonderful to see nations around the world, Chile, the uh, UK, little island nation of Palau, establishing 80% of their exclusive economic zone where even the fish are safe. And it's good for the fishermen who are local because the large-scale industrial fishers are excluded from the 200-mile area over which every nation with a coast now has jurisdiction. And it, it's like giving back. It's not, oh, you're, you're causing a problem, you're, you're keeping people out. No, you're giving back. You're creating these safe havens it's great for the fish and the whales and all the rest, but it's also great for us. Mm -hmm. Restoring what we've lost. We're not taking away, we're giving back. And huh, about 3% of the ocean, here's the ocean. So far we've managed to go from like zero or tiny fraction of 1% in the 60s and 70s. And then a slow increase, President George W. Bush made the largest marine protected area on the planet at the end of his administration by establishing the Papahanaumokuakea Marine Reserve using the Antiquities Act. Yoo-hoo. Fantastic. <laughs> and then came President Obama, who quadrupled the size of that wonderful thing that many presidents along the way, and starting with President Roosevelt in early in the 20th century, took action on the land around the Marine Reserve, but now embracing the ocean. You can't really separate land and sea. I mean, if we protected all of the land and failed to protect the ocean, we would still be in trouble. Mm -hmm. And it works both ways. We've got to look 
at the whole system. One big connected ecosystem, absolutely. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much. So it's been great. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, we'll be chatting with you again this week. So thanks very much. And thank you so much, Sylvia. This has been great. Thank you. Let's go diving. Let's go.